If there is even the slightest possibility of a second fascist era, we need to redouble our efforts to stop it. The first fascist era killed tens of millions of people in a world war, six million people in a genocide, destroyed the European labor movement, and indeed destroyed the democracies of most democratic countries at the time. That's not nothing. That's not a minor detail of history. We only escaped it at massive human, psychological, physical, economic cost. So if there's a slightest chance that it happens again, we need to understand why and we need to stop it. Hi, I'm Paul Mason, journalist, author, and filmmaker. And these are five ways to stop fascism. Number one, learn from history. The number one thing that we need to learn from history is that fascism takes off when large numbers of people experience a kind of mass religious conversion to far-right ideologies. It's not about going from 1,000 people to 2,000 people. It's about going from 2% in an election to 17% overnight and then taking power within three years. It, it's like a volcano. It happens very, very quickly. And in modern culture, we see the results. I mean, fascism is everywhere in the movies, but there's almost never a depiction of how it happens that an ordinary person in a small town become psychologically attuned to the idea of killing millions of people. We need to understand that from history. In Britain, we rightly remember that in 1936, in October, tens of thousands of people went to the streets in Cable Street, East London, and stopped the fascists marching through the East End, which was a Jewish area. So the first thing we need to learn is that if thousands of people turn out and physically prevent fascism from attacking minorities, it can succeed. It's also the case that throughout Europe in the 1930s, in places where fascism was a threat and then resisted, the only real thing that stopped them was a political alliance of the centre and the left. When the centre and the left were fighting each other, fascism won. When the left and the far left were fighting each other, as tragically my book points out happened in Germany, the fascists won. When the centre and the left combined, at great cost to both sides, with huge compromises and huge amounts of angst, they did stop fascism. That's the lesson we should draw from the 30s. People who study history rightly say that what triggered the first fascism was the possibility of workers' revolution, first in Russia, then in Germany, then in Italy, and indeed throughout Europe. And large sections of the middle class and the political elite looked at the working class and said, we're terrified of that, we need something to stop it. In fact, one of the best ways to understand the fascism of the 1930s was a revolution against the revolution. Today, we don't have a strong working class. We don't have a revolutionary working class. We don't have 13 million workers, as in Germany, voting for Marxist parties. But what we do have is Black Lives Matter. What we do have is large LGBTQ plus movements supported by governments. What we do have is the Me Too movement. We have women's rights, women's reproductive rights. And if fascism is the fear of freedom, triggered by a glimpse of freedom, then today's equivalent of those workers' revolutions are those movements where people, black people, women, ethnic minorities, others, who the fascists don't want to be free, are trying to free themselves. And it's the same impulse, the fear of freedom triggered by a glimpse of freedom among people who the fascists don't want to be free. Number two, accept it. Western society is in trouble. In the 30s, it's clear that the rise of fascism in Germany, for example, was driven by mass unemployment and the collapse of the economy. But in reality, there was more than that. It was about the collapse of a belief system, the collapse of a self-image that many German people had. We need to learn today to understand the rise of the far right in that context. Because yes, since 2008, the collapse of Lehman Brothers, there's been an economic crisis, there's been stagnation, there's been destabilization. But the people in power have thrown trillions of money, borrowed and even printed at that problem. There are still new coffee bars opening. There is not mass unemployment. So why is there fascism? My answer is there is fascism 
even despite no mass unemployment, because there is mass disorientation, because people can't see the future, because they were sold the idea that history had ended, that free market globalized economics was the end point of, of world development and nothing better could be imagined. And now they look at a world where Afghanistan, Kabul falls in two days and the Americans can do nothing. And Russia walks into Ukraine and lo and behold, the American president is inciting a fascist mob. And they think that's not the world I was told to expect. What is the answer? Now, unless the left or indeed liberalism can come up with a convincing, living, breathing alternative, the only alternative people have is the colour of their skin, the religion they grew up with, and for men, their status within male-dominated societies. And this is why we're seeing the return of racism, nationalism, xenophobia, and kind of organised violent misogyny. The combination of mass disillusionment in the system with mass dissatisfaction with democracy is perfect for fascism because it says, look, we can solve that. You don't need democracy. There's a man here who will solve all your problems. He will deliver you from all the evils that you perceive. Leave it to him. And the left has a very difficult time countering that because the left says, no, you do it yourself. The left's politics are always, life is complicated. Uh, you, know, you must struggle. You must, if you want freedom, you must achieve it yourself. Fascists say, no, we can, we, we'll give it to you. We'll give you freedom. It just unfortunately involves taking about six million people and killing them. But you'll have freedom. That at a time of crisis becomes very, very attractive. We must never underestimate how attractive it was, not to a few tens of thousands of evil people, but to millions of really ordinary, quite good people. That's the threat. Number three, we need to be proud active anti-fascists. If I say to you the word anti-fascist or its shortened form antifa, then you'll probably think of somebody on a demonstration trying to stop the far right marching through an area, being chased by the police, having you know their house under surveillance by the far right, being threatened, being doxxed. We need to own anti-fascism as a mass thing. We need to say no more are we going to leave it up to brave individual activists, NGOs, monitoring groups to do the anti-fascism. We need to embody it first and foremost in our everyday lives. I mean, just saying, I'm against fascism. I'm against racism. I'm against violent misogyny. The idea of a global ethnic civil war is an abomination. Fantasies of genocide are not acceptable. We need to say that to the people who are coming out with this stuff. And ultimately, yes, in the end, some of us are going to have to stand on street corners and stop the far right marching into migrant areas. Yeah, we're going to do that. But much more important is that we embody the principle of anti-fascism, almost an ethos of anti-fascism in our everyday lives. If we do that, the ideological space that's created every time some taxi driver comes out with some racist or sexist comment, if we do that, we close down the ideological space for the people who in the end are going to put us in a concrete box from which we do not emerge. It's no longer the case that simply by physically suppressing fascist activity we're going to stop it. it. The ideas are out there. They're out there in the form of the QAnon conspiracy theory. When the QAnon conspiracy theory says Hollywood is full of people who drink children's blood and use it to gain everlasting life, it's just to repeat of the slander against the Jewish people that the Nazis perpetrated, you know, a hundred years ago. That's all it is, but it's out there. We're dealing with, with a mass process of psychological and quasi-religious conversion. It is underway. And so what do you do against that? Sadly, the kind of liberal idea is, well, you reason with them. You, yes, you, let's reason with them. Let's. Uh, introduce them to science, but as you do so, you will find that they already have an anti-science pre-prepared, ready to copy and paste into any Facebook group, any Reddit channel, where you're confronting them with logic and science. So it needs to go beyond that. In the 1930s, there was this French anarchist who toured early Nazi Germany, and he said, look, the only thing that could have stopped this, when it gets to the stage of mass quasi-religiousness, is a living, breathing alternative. So we have to 
produce a, a living, breathing alternative. And my alternative, yes, is anti-capitalism, but yours doesn't need to be. If you're a liberal, even if you're a liberal conservative, you need to produce a living, breathing alternative that is attractive and more attractive than the racist, misogynist utopia being peddled by Trump and his supporters. Number four, we need a political alliance of the left and the center. We're facing now a bunch of people who want to kick off a global ethnic civil war. They openly fantasize about genocide. Now, if we're faced with that, we need the maximum number of people united around this, the one objective of stopping it. And the history of the 1930s, which I explore in my book, shows that that was the only way it was done. When it was left to the working class alone, the working class alone, even when it had like millions of active Marxists, couldn't stop fascism. Neither could the liberal bourgeois elite. When they combined together, what happened? They didn't just combine, or rather compromise, between their two ideologies. A new ethos was born. The ethos you see in movies like Casablanca, which is an ethos of anti-fascism. It's a moral philosophy, which doesn't just have a negative to it, which is stopping the fascists. It has something positive, a positive vision of humanity that the left and the center could for that one moment in history, share, and indeed did share, in the process of defeating Hitler, defeating Mussolini, and ending the Second World War. I think the first thing we're gonna to have to do to create the alliance we need to stop fascism is to just have a, a kind of frank discussion within the left and a frank discussion within the liberal center. I mean, the liberal center's just got to stop the kind of ignore them, they'll go away attitude. They've got to stop treating the left as if it's the main enemy. They've got to admit that some things they screwed up. One would be um, imposing 10 years of austerity so that life never gets better. The left, well, the first thing you learn, I've been a leftist for 40 odd years. First thing you learn on the left is popular fronts are bad. The cross-class alliance of the 1930s ended in tragedy. Well, it did, it did end in tragedy. The Spanish Civil War was lost. The French popular front stopped fascism, but then fell apart. I think we must cease awarding ourselves the luxury of ignoring the real lessons of the Popular Front. The Popular Front's formal political agreements between liberals, socialists and communists did for a time stop fascism. I will take that as a historical outcome. Despite all the compromises, they had to sing the national anthem, they had to vote for the, uh, for the army budget, they had to fly the national flag and not the red flag. And in France, they stopped supporting the rights of French colonies to independence. That was the price the communists paid for joining the Popular Front. What did they gain? Mass strikes, mass movement, mass influence, and a political and indeed uh, cultural movement, the like of which we certainly haven't seen in, in our lifetimes, but then set the entire agenda of the next 10, probably the next 50 years. Everything that was done after the Second World War to democratize the world, to install human rights universally, was done because of the anti-fascist ethos that was born in the 30s. And what I would like to do with my book and in the discussions around it is invite people to rekindle a new version of that ethos so that when we have defeated this far right, we don't just stop. We, we build a better world based on universal values and, and, the, and above all on human beings. The stakes are huge. And learning the lessons of the Popular Fronts in the 1930s is obligatory for anybody who wants to do politics today. Number five, we need new anti-fascist laws and regulations. Here's three things we could do legally and using regulation to suppress modern fascism. First, ban uniformed parades. What they specialize in are, even when they're wearing weird uniforms, like the Boogaloo boys with their Hawaiian shirts, or the Pro boys with their, their Fred Perry shirts and their funny hats, or their kilts, what they want and what they specialize in is the militarization of public space. So that you are there just as an individual, maybe protesting them, you know, sometimes maybe with your kids with you, but they are there, tooled up, ready, often armed in America, you've just got to say no more, that you know, we can't have the luxury of that. The second is to criminalize hate speech. Now it already is criminalized, but it's still there. So what's going wrong? We're not enforcing laws against hate speech. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube have become the great, greatest accelerators 
of genocidal thought and incitement to violence in the world. You can pass laws against it, but you also have to do something to the corporations themselves. And I've become convinced we need to regulate them as if they were newspapers or TV shows. If the Daily Mail incited violence, it would be prosecuted. Unfortunately, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter and the rest have become platforms for exactly this. And so we need to regulate them. We also finally, and this again, I'm, I know I'm going to be unpopular here. Anonymity is sometimes necessary for people, but it's not necessary for the human species to be interacting with millions of fake accounts. Our artificial person can slander me, can threaten me with violence. What's the downside of eradicating large amounts of non-existent people and content generated by them? Why should there be anonymity for that person? That's a hard thing to say because, of course, anonymity is useful for people who are suffering domestic violence, people who haven't come out yet who might be gay. Yes, but there's always a trade-off. And I think we should have an honest discussion about the trade-offs that an anonymity um, creates. And we shouldn't automatically accept that fascists have a right to anonymously threaten us with death. The legal crackdown on fascism does not in itself defeat fascism. Combined with a mass movement, mass resistance, and combined with the fight for an anti-fascist ethos within our culture and society, I think it does give us the chance. And the, the evidence for that is all the places where fascism was a threat in the 30s, where these three things were done, mass resistance, legal crackdown, anti-fascist ethos, and they defeated fascism. We only have one case study, the 30s, and we have to draw every lesson we can from it because the new 30s are approaching. Yes, of course, I believe we can defeat fascism. The fascists, where they were defeated in the 30s, were actually, actually defeated by people who had hope, who had made a moral choice that they were going to stop fascism. By taking that decision to be an anti-fascist, to activate your anti-fascist impulses, you will force others around you. You will oblige others around you to, to take their decisions. And before we know it, we'll have a mass cultural movement that is positive, that celebrates life, that celebrates diversity, that celebrates women's advance towards reproductive rights and personal freedom, and the fascists will go back into their hole, which is where they belong. But it's gonna need you to do something, not somebody else. So think about it. Thanks for watching. You can get my book, How to Stop Fascism, in hardback, audiobook, or ebook by clicking on the link in the description below. And don't forget to click here to subscribe to Penguin for more videos like this.